Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar, which is number 190 in this series from the Canadian Club of Rome. I want to welcome Dr. John Cook from Melbourne University, who's our guest. And I'll start by just explaining my thinking and inviting John. Uh, we know that in the work that we're trying to do at KCOR, we have a mortal enemy, which is the fossil fuel industry, uh, which is more money than God. It has tremendous political clout. Um, and as a business plan to continue making lots of money uh, while frying the planet. So, and one of their main tools that they use is misinformation, like the tobacco industry before them. And they're very sophisticated in doing that to the extent that even well-educated and uh, interested people like ourselves can be taken in and find ourselves uh, repeating some of the misinformation that they, they put around. So uh, with that background, I was very interested to come across uh, Dr. John Cook's uh, work. Um, he, he's, he studies this field of misinformation. Uh, you can read what it says in the slide about his bio. Uh, I came across him through this book, the, it's, I don't know if you can see it there, The Cranky <laughs> Uncle, which is like a cartoon book, uh, but it's educational, it's for adults, and it's to explain the kind of dialogue that may go on when you're dealing with someone who has uh, been taken in by misinformation. Uh, John has also um, uh, created a, a game that you can run on your uh, smartphone, which uh, tests your ability to, to, to spot misinformation. And he also uh, runs a course, which an online course on the subject, which you can sign up for and uh, uh, go through the full process of being educated on, on the subject. So, uh, John, we're very delighted to have you with us, and um, please, over to you. We're uh, so looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much, David, and thanks for the invitation to talk. It's, it's a real honour. So, I'm going to be talking about my research into misinformation about climate change. Firstly, understanding it, and then secondly, doing something about it. How do we counter misinformation? And I really started researching this during my PhD back a lifetime ago. Um, or it was 2017, so it wasn't that long ago. But um, uh, this was a paper that I published in 2017, uh, research I did during my PhD, where I was grappling with the question, how do we counter misinformation? What are effective ways to debunk um, or pre-bunk? How do we do it? What are the techniques? And so in this experiment, um, what I did was I, I showed um, participants in the experiment misinformation about climate change. Uh, this was the actual misinformation that I was showing them. And it's taken verbatim from a website called the Global Warming Petition Project, which features a list of 31,000 science graduates from the US who have signed a statement saying that humans aren't disrupting climate. Now, after I showed people this misinformation, then I measured their attitudes about climate change. And what I found was the misinformation reduced people's perceptions about climate change. Misinformation works, as you would expect. It has a negative effect. But the negative effect isn't the same across the population. What I found was the more politically conservative people were, the bigger the effect that the misinformation had in pulling down people's climate perceptions. This graph here shows the change in people's perceived consensus. I asked people, what percentage of climate scientists do you think uh, um, agree that humans are causing global warming? Uh, and what we found was amongst conservatives, that estimated consensus went down around 20%. Uh, but for people who were at the left end of the political spectrum, there was no change in their consensus, per perceived consensus. So the misinformation didn't have any effect on people on the left. What this tells us is that misinformation has about climate change, noting this is this is not the case necessarily with all misinformation, just misinformation about climate change, it has a polarizing effect. As misinformation washes over society, people's beliefs get further apart as the misinformation has more effect on some people compared to others. 
in my experiment uh, with another group of participants, I first showed them a inoculating message um, before showing them the misinformation. And this is an excerpt of the inoculation message. And I use the word inoculation very deliberately. We were actually drawing upon a branch of psychological research called inoculation theory. In inoculation theory, it takes the idea of vaccination and applies it to knowledge. Just as with vaccination, when you expose people to a weakened version of a virus, building up your immunity to the actual virus, in the same way, you can expose people to a weakened version of misinformation and that builds up their immunity to the actual misinformation so that when they encounter misinformation out in the real world, they're less likely to be misled. But how do you deliver misinformation in a weakened form? The way you do it is you explain the technique used to mislead. In the case of the Global Warming Petition Project, the technique is fake experts. Uh, using people who convey the impression of expertise, but don't have the actual relevant expertise. In the case of the petition project, there were 31,000 science graduates. And that sounds like a lot of experts, right? But they were science graduates in any field of science, computer science, medical science, veterinary science, but almost none of the 31,000 had actual climate expertise. But if people are not paying close attention, they just come away with the impression that, that they're all experts. What I found was when I um, inoculated people to the fake expert strategy, then I showed them misinformation that used the fake expert strategy, then the misinformation was neutralized. The blue line here shows the change in climate perceptions amongst the inoculated group. And although there's a slight slope to this line, it's actually statistically like a flat line. In other words, the misinformation was not working for anyone across the political spectrum. And this tells us another important thing, well, two things really. Firstly, nobody likes being misled. Whether you're liberal or conservative, when you explain the techniques used to mislead, those techniques no longer work on that person. Secondly, and I'll just go back to my slide here um, because I forgot to mention before, we didn't in our inoculating message even mention the Global Warming Petition Project. Instead, we spoke about the technique of fake experts in general terms, and we used a different subject, tobacco misinformation, as our example of the fake expert strategy. And we found that even though we didn't mention the Global Warming Petition Project, we were still able to neutralize that specific piece of misinformation. In other words, inoculating people by explaining the techniques used to mislead can work across topics. I was basically inoculating them specifically against tobacco and misinformation, but it also had a flow on effect and in, in inoculated people against climate misinformation. In other words, this approach, this logic-based approach, explaining the logical fallacies or rhetorical techniques used in misinformation, it's kind of like a universal vaccine against misinformation. So given that explaining the techniques of misinformation is the key, or, or not the key, but it's a useful and effective tool in countering misinformation, next, I started working on how, how are effective ways to um, explain the techniques of misinformation. And I found a useful framework for doing this was the FLIC framework. FLIC standing for the five techniques or characteristics of science denial. Make experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking, and conspiracy theories. The challenge though is these five techniques are not just techniques, they're actually categories of misinformation. Because underneath these five uh, techniques are actually a whole family of, of different logical fallacies and rhetorical techniques and traits of conspiratorial thinking. 
So um, let me just delve briefly into some of these techniques just to give you a, a bit more of a concrete idea of what they look like uh, in climate misinformation. So the first technique is fake experts. And we already saw that example in the Global Warming Petition Project. People who convey that impression of expertise but don't have the actual relevant expertise. And um, the Global Warming Petition Project is the most prominent example of it. In fact, it's fake experts in bulk because it's not just one fake expert, but 31,000. Uh, and in real life, we don't tolerate fake expertise when it comes to issues that really matter. We would not want a computer scientist doing heart surgery on us. And climate change is a complicated, serious, um, consequential topic. Uh, and so in the same way, we shouldn't um, have to tolerate people who don't have relevant, ex relevant expertise misleading the public about climate change. The second um, technique in FLIC is logical fallacies. And again, this is a, um, covers a whole range of different fallacies. But the most common one, um, or one of the most common ones you're probably going to encounter in climate misinformation is the single cause fallacy. And that is when someone assumes that something only has a single factor or single thing causing it and ignores other possible factors. Uh, here is an example of the single cause fallacy in climate misinformation. Uh, the argument that climate has always changed in the past, therefore, uh, and before humans were around, therefore, um, what happened to cause climate change back then must have been natural, uh, and what's happening to cause climate change now must also be natural. Uh, and it's often said in very simple, um, seemingly profound ways, climate is changing because climate has always changed. It's almost a um, knee-jerk reaction when people who are dismissive about climate change hear the phrase climate change. The problem with this argument is it commits single, for, single cause fallacy. Uh, the argument, one of the reasons why climate is changing is because climate has always changed. That's exactly the same as seeing a murder victim and saying, this person died of natural causes because people have always died of natural causes. Assuming that natural causes are the only single cause when there can be multiple causes. And in fact, there is a lot of evidence that something else is the cause currently. Impossible expectations is the third flick technique. And this involves uh, demanding uh, unrealistic um, standards of scientific proof, basically saying that science has to definitively perfectly prove something before we act on it. And that's not how we operate in the real world. Um, it's a bit like falling to the ground and uh, being told that uh, there's a range of estimates in, in when you're going to hit the ground. Uh, and that's, that's not good enough. That's saying, well, I'm only interested in what the science has to say when you can give me a definite answer. In the case of climate change, we know that there are going to be serious impacts coming down the track. And in fact, we're already experiencing serious impacts. We might not know exactly how much the impacts will be or when exactly they will encounter. We just know that they're coming down the pipeline. But delaying climate action because we don't have enough certainty um, is an example of impossible expectations. The fourth technique of science denial is cherry picking, which involves, generally speaking, um, looking at one piece of evidence while ignoring the big picture. And this is done in a lot of different ways, but I'll use one example because it comes up every year. Uh, and that's a subset of cherry picking called anecdotal thinking. Um, here's the classic example of anecdotal thinking. Um, the argument that uh, it's cold, therefore global warming doesn't exist. You hear this every winter. People argue, well, what, what happened to global warming, eh? As soon as uh, the weather gets cold. But this logic is exactly the same as arguing it's dark, therefore the sun doesn't exist. It's looking at just your specific 
situation at a moment of time at a particular place and ignoring the bigger picture. It's anecdotal thinking. And while this is a ridiculous argument, obviously, it's the same logic as arguing that cold weather disproves global warming. I'm going to talk a little bit more about all these cartoons in a second, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, and the, the fifth technique of science denial is conspiracy theories. Whenever a person denies a scientific consensus, rejects what the global community of scientists agree on, then conspiracy theories become inevitable. Because how else do you explain that the whole world community of scientists um, believe something that disagrees with you? Uh, and there are seven traits of conspiratorial thinking, and we, and we document these in the conspiracy theory handbook. Um, and the URL to the handbook, which you can download for free, is at the bottom of this slide. Uh, and I won't get into the details of the traits of conspiratorial thinking because uh, it takes too long, but I can always come back to those during um, uh, the Q&A if people are interested. But I will just highlight two of them. Uh, one is that conspiracy theorists see patterns everywhere. They see meaning in randomness. Uh, and so when two events happen or just even one random event happens, they will imbue meaning in it or they will join the dots between random events uh, and create these false narratives just based on detecting false patterns. The second trait of conspiratorial thinking is immunity to fact. Uh, and the, the problem with conspiratorial thinking is um, it comes with a high distrust of scientific facts and scientific institutions. So that makes it really difficult to change a conspiracy theorist's mind because whenever you present any evidence that disproves their conspiracy theory, their response is to expand their conspiracy theory to include that evidence. In other words, they will argue, well, that evidence was created by the conspirators. Then that's just what they want you to believe. Uh, and you can't, or it's really difficult to convince someone when they just have that kind of um, nihilistic skepticism. They just uh, don't believe any evidence that contradicts their beliefs. Uh, so I want to move on from the five traits of conspiratorial thinking to some other research we published in 2020. So this was after I had done my initial research finding the um, effectiveness of logic-based inoculation. And then I wanted to dig deeper into how do you practically apply this? What are some ways to practically um, uh, inoculate or, or debunk misinformation? Uh, and ideally at scale, um, something you could do on social media, for instance. And um, I was also experimenting with humor at this point um, because, uh, and the clue that I was doing that is all the cartoons I just showed you. Um, but the reason why I got into this was because I, I, um, some work I was doing with some critical thinking philosophers um, pointed out to me a, the technique of parallel argumentation, which is um, taking the flawed logic from misinformation and transplanting it into a parallel situation to show how ridiculous or flawed the original logic was. And I gave you some examples of that. Cold weather and snow being the same as arguing that nighttime disproves the sun. Take that flawed logic and then transplant it into a extreme um, version of the same logic. And so in this experiment, what we wanted to do was test humorous um, logic analogies, like the one I just, uh, you know, that approach I just uh, explained. Um, so test the logic-based approach to countering misinformation, but also compare it to countering misinformation by explaining the facts. And these really are the two main ways of countering misinformation. You can either explain the facts to show how the misinformation is wrong, or you can explain the logical fallacy in the misinformation to explain how it misleads. We were interested in testing 
whether one approach was more effective than the other. And the other thing we wanted to do was test, did it matter whether the mis misinformation came after your correction? In other words, you were pre-bunking the misinformation or if the debunking came after the misinformation. So we were testing pre-bunking versus debunking. Here were the results from our experiment. And what we were measuring in this graph was people's belief in the plant food myth. This is the climate myth that argues that plants need CO2. It's part of photosynthesis. Therefore, CO2 is plant food and it's good. We should be emitting more CO2 and it will be good for plants. Uh, and so the higher the value in this graph, the higher the belief in the plant food myth. And our goal with our experiment was to try to bring that misperception down. Uh, and these five bars represent five different groups in our experiment. The first bar were the people who were only shown the misinformation. So they were shown mis the, an example of the plant food myth, arguing here is a plant that has been exposed to CO2 and look how well it's growing. And as you would expect, belief in the plant food myth was highest for people in that condition. Now, let me jump over to the right-hand side of the graph. The two uh, rightmost bars, the orange and the yellow one, these were the groups who were shown the logic-based correction. That was where it explained the fallacy of oversimplification. And what we found was belief in the plant food myth significantly went down compared to the misinformation group. So the logic-based correction was effective in reducing belief in the misperception. And it was an equally effective um, statistically, whether it was a pre-bunking or a debunking. So logic-based corrections worked. Now I'll take you to the middle part where we have the green and the blue. The green bar were people who were shown the correction first, the fact-based explanation of how plants need CO2, but they also need a wide variety of conditions in order to flourish. They were shown the fact, the factual explanation, and then they were shown the misinformation afterwards. And the blue, people were shown the misinformation first, and then the facts last. If people were shown the facts last, so that the facts were the last thing that people were shown, then it was effective in correcting the misinformation. However, the green bar shows that when people were shown the facts first, but then the misinformation was the last thing that people encountered, the misinformation cancelled out the facts. And it was statistically no different to the misinformation condition. In other words, mis the misinformation cancelled out the, the factual explanation. And this uh, result actually has big consequences for anyone involved in science communication or education or just communication of facts. It means that our attempts to explain the facts to people can be cancelled out by misinformation depending on the context in which people receive it, whether the order in which they receive information. And we don't know what order people get information. We don't know how they're consuming information. And so that means that our attempts to explain the facts are vulnerable. They can be cancelled out. So this result, like my earlier experiment, really underscored for me the importance of this logic-based approach, which is another way of saying we need to build people's critical thinking skills so that when we send our facts out into the world, that they'll be robust, that they'll be less vulnerable to being undermined by misinformation. And that brings us back again to Flick and explaining to people, educating people about the techniques of science denial. And, um, and one thing you probably come away with looking at this slide is just how many techniques there are in misinformation. And this isn't a comprehensive slide by any means. Right? There's a lot more that I could cram in here and I have been meaning to update it actually. But 
that presents a communication and education challenge. How do you not only make people aware of these different techniques, but internalize them deeply enough that when they encounter misinformation out in the real world, on social media, in conversation, on TV, how can they be familiar enough with the techniques that they can spot them in real time? That's a big challenge. Uh, and I've been grappling with that practical question for, for years. And eventually, uh, actually by serendipity really, I happened to um, meet some app developers, game developers uh, at a misinformation conference in Washington, DC. And we began collaborating. Uh, and eventually we developed the Cranky Uncle game, which is a game that teaches the flick taxonomy to people. You can see in the right-hand side here, the five techniques of science denial. Um, and what this game does is it uh, teaches players how to spot misinformation, um, but by using all the different elements of gameplay uh, as a way to incentivize players and, and to make it more interactive and fun. So there's two elements to the Cranky Uncle game. And by the way, uh, you can check it out at crankyuncle.com. You can play it on your browser. You can download it on your iPhone or your Android phone. Uh, and the game is free, um, free to everyone and anyone. Firstly, the game explains the flick techniques. So um, it starts with a Cranky Uncle character who is um, the science denying family member that, that we all seem to have. I don't recall ever meeting anyone who doesn't seem to have a cranky, cranky uncle of some sort in their life. I have several in my own life. And um, cranky uncle basically explains the techniques of science denial. And I use parallel arguments, logic analogies, uh, as a way to make them more concrete and visual and hopefully entertaining. Then the second element of the cranky uncle game is getting players practicing critical thinking. So I show them examples of misinformation and then they have to identify the technique used. And as they play the game, they have to do more quizzes. Uh, and the more quizzes they do, the more points they collect and the more they level up. Uh, and the game uses those gameplay elements of collecting points and leveling up to incentivize the players to do quizzes because every time I do a quiz, they're practicing critical thinking and over time they get better and quicker at spotting the techniques of denial. Uh, once we launched the game, then uh, the challenge was how do we get the game in front of um, people who need it? Uh, and uh, I decided that uh, educators was probably one of the most effective ways to distribute the game. Uh, and so we we outreached to teachers. I developed a teacher's guide to Cranky Uncle, um, which provided, well, firstly, it explained the science behind the game, inoculation theory, and the, basically what I've been talking about for the last 20 minutes. Uh, but then it offered lots of suggestions for classroom activities that taught critical thinking uh, and also uh, use the Cranky Uncle game as a fun, interactive way to engage students. What I found uh, to my surprise was a wide range of subjects adopting the game. Uh, the game is general in its approach, but there is a lot of climate examples in there because climate change has been my main research focus. So I expected that the game would mostly be used in subjects to do with climate science or environmental science. But to my delight and surprise, I found that the game was being uh, used in classrooms across a whole range of subjects, not just science subjects, but English and um, psychology, maths, um, uh, like really basically any subject that has um, misinformation in it. And that's really any subject. Uh, it turns out that critical thinking can help students spot misinformation across all topics, which I guess was 
I shouldn't have been surprised because that was what we found in, in my initial study back going way back to 2017. Uh, and um, we've, we're finding that the game is being adopted in states. Um, well, so I apologize for the US centric uh, aspect here. Um, um, being from Canada, it hasn't been adopted in as much in Canada as it has been in the US, um, and even less in Australia, which is a bit of a disappointment to me. I was actually based in the US when we launched the game, and um, the, so most of the attention and, and focus has been in, uh, in the US. But we're we're now trying to broaden that, and in fact, the game has been translated into thirteen different languages. We just completed Romanian, and uh, that's about to uh, get pushed to the App Store and, and be made available to people sometime over the next couple of weeks. And all the translations have been done by volunteers as well. So we actually have a, a um, volunteer form where people can um, offer to help us translate. And um, yeah, we, we, it's an ongoing process. There's several other languages on the go. Uh, so we are uh, hopeful to continue to release the game in more languages. Now, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was after we launched the Cranky Uncle game, which we now call Cranky Uncle Classic to distinguish it from other versions, then we got approached by UNICEF and the Sabin Vaccine Institute who were interested in developing a vaccine version of the game. Um, and this made a lot of sense um, given that a there is a lot of misinformation about vaccines which have quite a harmful effect in reducing people's intent to get vaccinated and that has specific um, and consequential health implications for the public uh, and secondly because cranky uncle is essentially a critical thinking game um, it uh, critical thinking can be adapted and applied to other topics quite readily. And so um, over the last few years, I've been working with UNICEF to develop this vaccine version of the game. Uh, and there were some interesting distinctions between this and the original classic version of the game. One of the differences being uh, we added a new character to the game for, for the vaccine version. It was important to UNICEF that they included um, vaccine facts in the game as well. They didn't want to just explain techniques in vaccine misinformation. They also wanted people to understand more um, how vaccines work, the science and research into vaccines, and uh, just general facts about vaccines. So the way we decided to do that was we added a new character, a healthcare worker. Uh, and through the course of the game, the healthcare worker would explain the facts about vaccines, and then Cranky Uncle would explain how he uses his different techniques to cast doubt on the facts. And so essentially what this game was doing more explicitly than the original version was it was incorporating fact-based inoculation as well as logic-based inoculation. The game also included quiz questions in the same way that we did in the classic version. Um, but note the characters. Um, they they uh, looked, uh, these are new characters that we added to the game, um, differently to the original version of the game. And there's a very deliberate strategy there as well. UNICEF are interested in raising vaccination rates in specific parts of the world. And it was important to them that the game looked like the people that they were um, trying to outreach to. And so to make sure that we did that in a appropriate way, we ran co-design workshops in uh, various countries, starting in Uganda, Kenya, and Rwanda. And uh, we're heading down to nearly two years ago that we um, ran the first co-design workshops. And the way we, we did that was the first step was showing them cartoon sketches uh, of all the characters in the game. And then the co-design participants uh, gave feedback on them. You can see the sticky notes in this photo where they were 
giving us comments on the characters, what they should have, what they shouldn't have, what was right, what was wrong, and also voting on the various versions of the characters' kind of reality show style. So we narrowed it down to one uh, consensus character that everyone agreed on. Um, and they also played the, the early version of the game and gave us feedback on the content and the gameplay as well. This is the set of characters that we came up with for East Africa. Um, and then we've, since then, we've also run other co-design workshops in several other countries. Once we had finished the game, uh, updated it after the co-design workshops, then we ran a pilot test. And the way the pilot test worked was before people played the game, we would have them fill out a research survey. And part of the research survey had showed them a series of statements. Some of them were factual statements. Some of them were misinformation statements. And we were asking them to rate how true they thought these different uh, statements were. Uh, and the here is the results from our research. The red bars are what they filled out before they played the game. And the blue bar is what they filled out after they played the game. And what we were hoping to see was that with vaccine facts, their agreement with the facts would go up. And with vaccine fallacies, their agreement would go down. Uh, and it was really important to see that pattern. There's one challenge for researchers working on interventions to counter misinformation. We don't want to see people just become cynical about all information. In other words, we stop them believing in fallacies, but even reduce their belief in facts or uh, re reduce their belief in, in accurate news. Uh, we we don't want to see just a general overall cynicism. Rather, we want to see an increase in discernment, their ability to discern between factual information and misinformation. And we were happy to see that we did see an increase in discernment uh, from the vaccine, um, the cranky uncle vaccine game. And one thing that I think was important to achieving this was the combination of the fact-based inoculation with logic-based inoculation, having the healthcare worker explain the facts and then having Cranky Uncle explain how he used fallacies. The other thing we asked players before and after the game was their general vaccine attitudes and most importantly, their intent to get vaccinated. And um, what we saw was a um, increase in both, a statistically significant increase. So their attitude in their general vac vaccine attitude went up um, and it was already quite high, but it went even higher. And also their intent to get vaccinated uh, increased significantly as well. And this was probably the result, the second graph, the likelihood of getting vaccinated. This is probably the result that we were most excited about because it is difficult to shift, statistically shift people's intent to get vaccinated from a single intervention. Um, and when we looked at people who started the game, when we jump back, when people um, filled out either somewhat unlikely or very unlikely, so they were at the bottom half of the intent um, question, we found that among those people, 58% of them shifted to a likely option after the game. So we saw a particularly dramatic improvement in the intent to get vaccinated amongst the people who were vaccine hesitant before the game. So that was quite an exciting result. Um, we've recently just finished a co-design workshop in Pakistan, and we're about to start a pilot test of the game there using, um, not English though, this time the game in Urdu and Roman Urdu, and they're gonna test both languages. So that's going to be uh, quite an interesting challenge. Um, and we'll, we'll see how the game goes there. So just stay tuned on that. Um, and I think I will finish there and I look forward to your questions and thank you for listening.
John, thank you. John, thank you very much for that. That was fascinating. Um, we don't have a lot of questions in the in the um, uh, chat just yet, so ask people to give some thought to what else you'd like to know and start putting your questions in there, if I'm looking in the right place. Um, I would ask a question of my own based on one of the comments made already by David Pollock. Um, clearly, it would be wonderful to get these game, this, the game into Canadian schools. Uh, any particular advice for us, John, and how we might go about that? Yeah, so um, so firstly, the game is very available to, to be used in Canadian schools, like, and it has already been in a small way. Um, and I'm not familiar with the education networks in Canada, but I'm I'm definitely happy to to talk to um, to any networks that that exist that might be interested in it and, and um, sharing our experiences and and different ways that teachers have been using it. So um, yeah, I, I could certainly go and um, happy to talk to the groups, but I would I would just send you to the crankyuncle.com website for starters. There's an educators link up top, which points you to the teacher's guide and some of the other resources we have. Um, and yeah. yeah. Thank you. So uh, Art has a question that Art Hunter, which she's going to put to you. And John Hollands, you're on deck afterwards. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, John. I guess I'm, I'm trying to relate to real experiences which I had and uh, I'm in in uh, other uh, you know mailing lists particularly with the people I graduated um, from university with and there are within there uh, a number of climate change deniers and who use uh, quite frankly I recognize just about everything you said because it's been used on me <laughs> and uh, um, and I say to myself, how do I approach a, a group like that who, quite frankly, they're, they're friends, they're colleagues. It's just, uh, you know, there's no adversarial relationship here, and, and I don't want it to get into that. Um, how, how would you recommend that I, I approach this group and, and try and point out some of their, you know, uh, uh, obviously critical thinking skill shortcomings. You know, I mean, that's pretty offensive. Yeah, so, yeah, it is tricky because um, you don't want to come across as a jerk <laughs> in your response because yeah. that can turn not only the, the um, climate skeptics or contrarians or deniers and turn them off, but also uh, even other people. When I, and let me give an example. So sometimes when I give public talks and there is a climate denier in the audience who asks a question and they, they propose a climate myth at me uh, in their question, um, the mindset I take in my approach is, and I talked earlier about how difficult it is to change a conspiracy theorist's mind. And, and it's the same with someone who's dismissive about climate change because they'll be dismissive of any scientific evidence I give um, that counters their, their argument. So given that, I take the mindset that it's unlikely that my response is going to change that person's mind. I mean, it will be great if it does, and I'm hopeful that it will, but I come into it with realistic expectations that the chances are low and therefore my response is more for the benefit of everyone else watching that exchange uh, more than or just as much as the person who i'm direct, directly responding to and firstly that helps me be a bit calmer and get less frustrated and not get angry in my response uh, but secondly it also gives me that mindset of let's try to turn this exchange into an educational opportunity um, and so I do try to explain how the argument is misleading, but not in a way that says you're an idiot for believing that, but just here is here is a way that 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 here is the rhetorical technique or logical fallacy that that argument contains. And then if I 
am thinking quickly enough on the fly, I will try to use a parallel argument because they are a really powerful way to to make the uh, explanation concrete and relatable and sometimes entertaining. So I'll say, well, that's just like um, the cold, you know, it's like arguing that dark, you know, nighttime disproves the sun or that's like saying that um, cigarettes were around before humans, therefore cigarettes don't cause cancer. You know, it's kind of trying to, uh, to to use parallel arguments just to um, flesh out and make logical, critical thinking explanations a bit more concrete and reliable. Yeah. Okay. No, I, and the other thing I was going to say, sorry, I just forgot, was um, also depending on the context, it can be constructive to go into it with a attitude also of um, genuine curiosity and empathy and try to understand why they believe their arguments and encourage them to articulate it because uh, um, understanding why a person believes it or what are the supporting arguments that they have for their position, that can also kind of bring um, unstated assumptions up to the surface and, and then you can dig into it a little bit deeper. Yeah, I, I just want to comment that I, I have used the, the argument that says the difference be, you, you know, you can have all sorts of theories. People can make theories at any time. And, um, but once you have measurement, you know, that's kind of hard to refute. But then you have to build the, the link between carbon dioxide and the melting ice cap. <laughs> okay. Because you can't argue the ice caps are not melting because it's, it's being observed and measured. But you know how can some people you, do that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, there's yeah, I mean, you 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 can go off and do that by uh, and and there's lots of things on the internet. But at yeah, at the time, that that's kind of hard to do unless you're well prepared. Anyway, thank you for your response. Yeah. yeah, thank you, John. So uh, Ted Manning has a question next, and Anita Thorhag uh, is on deck. Thank you very much, John. That was wonderful. Uh, and it kind of reaffirms all of our prejudices. <laughs> uh, I put out not so much a question as a comment, but I'm asking for advice. And right at the moment, the bulk of ads on our television in Canada are from exceptionally well-funded fossil fuel companies who, with any money they have left over from, from bribing and buying politicians, they use to put on our air with some of the most sophisticated and well-produced commercials there are showing beautiful people enjoying clean air that they are helping produce by uh, us paying them to, to extract fossil fuels. So our real question right now is how do we counter that? How can we get another message or getting people to question those messages which they are being inundated with? Yeah, that's that's a really good question, Ted. Um, and uh, a, a subtle but growing form of misinformation, particularly from the fossil fuel industry, mm -hmm. is greenwashing. Yeah. And the challenge of greenwashing, which is um, polluting companies painting the impression that they're actually good for the environment, mm -hmm. the challenge of it is they can often misinform the public while saying things that are true. For example, they might say, our company has just spent $10 million on solar panels. We are, And then they'll have lots of video of solar panels and then children skipping through the grass or something. Yeah, that's probably so, what they're putting on our TV right now. <laughs> and, and that's, and from a misinformation fact check point of view, everything that they might show in that ad is factually correct. They are spending $10 million. Yeah. But what they're not communicating is that that $10 million is 0.1% of their total budget and 99.9% .9 of their budget is spent on polluting um, fossil fuels. Uh, and so the way that you um, counter greenwashing is by pointing out the discrepancy between their words and their actions. Mm -hmm. um, because one thing that people don't like is hypocrisy. And mm -hmm. so if you show explicitly the hypocrisy, and that the 
they're well, two things people don't like hypocrisy and being misled. So mm. if you point out that they are being hypocrites and misleading you in the same same breath, then that is one way of inoculating people against greenwashing techniques. So basically well, I think we my, get my in front of the same millions of people who are sucking up what they're producing. Well, yeah, see and here you have the um the unlevel playing field because they have yeah. such budgets they have um you know and they've invested uh, historically billions of dollars into misinforming yeah. the public oh yeah uh, and i wish i had an easy answer i wish i had a um you know i wish i had a couple of billion dollars handy to invest into informing the public um so i think that um well Firstly, we need to be persistent as citizens in in um, getting that message out, communicating it to people, and well, well, that's really it. Like, I mean, there's lots of things we can do. We can petition our politicians. We can um, um, vote. <laughs> there's lots of things that we can do. But ultimately, the most important thing that all of us can do is just open our mouths and speak about the issue, and build social momentum. Um, Industry and politicians pay a lot of attention to social momentum. So uh, that's that's one thing that all of us as citizens can contribute to. Thanks very much, John. Sounds like you got the same problem in Australia. I think I've seen some very good commercials from the other side from you guys as well. <laughs> yeah, the, the fossil fuel industries in Australia are very good at communication and, and good at yeah. communi community outreach too. Like my sister lives in a mining town in North Queensland and mm -hmm. her children, her boys play football or play football when they were younger. Mm -hmm. And they had a um, mining industry mascot who would mm -hmm. go to the children's football games. It was a, a, a grown adult in a giant costume, a lump of coal. His name was Hector, <laughs> the lump of coal. And he was there to you know, basically promote the, the coal mining industry to children at football games. So that's the kind of thing we're up against. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, Anitra, can you go ahead? Um, thank you for a very, very interesting set on the whole problem of climate change. Um, I'm interested in how much money you think is being spent on misinformation and whether they have actual campaigns on the social media, which is, of course, would be brainwashing the younger sectors. And the third part of that question is, is this working in communist nations as well as democracies, or does this only mostly work in democracies because the communist nations have so much uh, misinformation that they're already very sensitive to it. Okay, so three questions, and just remind me, because often I'll forget the, the gratitude First questions. is how, I'm, much, I'm a, how, how much, what are their budgets? Social media, yes. Yes. So um, the difficulty of the how much question is over time, the fossil fuel industry have gotten more sophisticated at hiding their funding of misinformation. And the way they do that is through these um, basically dark money organizations like Donors Trust, where they donate to their money to Donors Trust, and then Donors Trust um, distributes the money to the different misinformation groups. That's a way it's, it just creates this, um, this barrier. So there's no direct line between industry and the, the final misinformation source. Um, and there's a great study by Bob Brewer, um who looked at the, the flow of funds from industry to conservative think tanks, which are one of the main organizations that distribute, create and distribute misinformation. He found that up to a billion dollars per year were going to conservative think tanks from corporate interests. And, but over time, the more and more of those donations were going through donors trust and other groups to hide the, the lines of funding. So basically you can you can say that 
hundreds of millions, two billions of dollars have been spent on climate misinformation from industry. Uh, and I, I would um, estimate that climate misinformation is probably the most well-funded misinformation campaign in human history. So that, and I think that kind of partially answers your first question as best as it is, as it is possible to answer it. As for social media, yes, there's definitely misinformation that has been used on uh, social media. And um, there's also been research into that, like um, Facebook advertising is very powerful because it can micro-target specific audience segments. And um, there is a lot of climate misinformation going, um, you know, targeting the public. Uh, and it's that also is difficult to track because it's somewhat opaque. Um, like Facebook don't make it particularly easy for people to find out who's doing what. But from what um, little bits we've been able to peek behind the curtains, we certainly see a lot of greenwashing advertising coming from industry. Um, the third question was, um, is this happening in communist countries as much as in democracies? And that's actually a really good question that I don't have a definitive answer to. Um, I haven't studied it and I don't recall off the top of my head any um, research that has looked specifically at that question. So yeah, that's definitely uh, something worth exploring. Interestingly, just last week, no, this week, I uh, gave a talk at Deakin University, which is also in Melbourne, uh, to a group who are interested in translating Cranky Uncle into Chinese. And they do a lot of work in China. So they're looking at trying to um, get critical thinking in Chinese classes, um, but all, they're also very sensitive to constraints because of the political situation in that country. So um, they had mentioned that the browser version of the game works, but Cranky Uncle works in China. But they're not sure that the iPhone and Android app, native apps will work in China. So uh, that that will be really interesting. Maybe a year from now, I'll have a better answer to your question after a bit of uh, experience. Oh. Um, but yeah, great question. Okay, thanks, John. So uh, John Hollins, I'm you're on now, but I, I'm just going to make a comment first. And Claude Butner, you would be on deck. Uh, I just wanted to throw in some information that I have, which is that there is an Australian outfit called Juice Media, which does a fantastic job of producing a very short, dynamic and somewhat aggressive and profane videos to debunk government uh, advertising and some, you know, misinformation. I, I put a link in the chat, which I recommend people to do, or you can just uh, Google Juice Media and watch one of their videos. They make them in their front, in their in their living room for about five thousand dollars a go, and they're extremely powerful. So go ahead, um, John. Yeah. Yeah, saying that they're somewhat profane is underselling them. They're <laughs> extremely profane, and um, so just just a little warning. I think that they're hilarious and brilliant. I love Juice Media. And they're in Melbourne too. I've never met them, but I would love to because I think that the work they do, it's really just a husband and wife and then two friends, colleagues, actors who do most of their front work. And But it's just yeah, really powerfully done. All right. John Hollins, go ahead. Thank you very much, David. Um, you probably answered my question already when you answered Anitra. Um, uh, you, and you mentioned that Donald Trump took chunks of money and distribute it uh, to folks. Um, I hope Donald Trump is a special case and it doesn't really work like that in Australia or Canada. Uh, but what is the primary way by, uh, presumably the, the, the fossil fuel industry is seeking to influence political decisions. Um, do they get to the politicians themselves other than Trump, or do they get to the politicians uh, via public, uh, by, by, through the citizens uh, taking, accepting the misinformation? Yeah, so firstly, to be clear, um, I wasn't saying Donald Trump, I was saying Donors Trust. That was oh, the sorry. name of the, <laughs> that was the name of the organization that, um, so, yeah, fossil fuel industries donate to this 
donors trust organization and then they distribute the money. I think the only money that Donald Trump is distributing to is his lawyers at the moment and <laughs> e, and E.G. and Carol as well. But um, I think that's about it. <laughs> so, um, so, but I think to answer your other question, um, certainly, yes, uh, the fossil fuel industry spend a lot of money on lobbying um, politicians and also on directly donating to politicians. And that's, I think that's money well spent if you're an industry wanting to continue your profits. So that's, that's very problematic because, um, you know, if our democracy is being undermined by vested interest um, don donations, then the public are not being well served. And also if the public are being misinformed by industry funded misinformation, um, a well-functioning democracy depends on a well-informed populace making decisions, voting decisions, um, you know, social, like societal decisions, civil decisions based on accurate information, not based on false information. So in both cases, um, the fossil fuel industry are undermining democracy. So the fossil fuel industry is not trying to get to political decision makers through electors like me and my neighbors they 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 go they tend to go directly to to the the, the people they want to to influence i think they do both they they walk and chew gum at the same time so they do yeah they directly um influence politicians but they also influence the public because if you keep the public um unsupportive of climate action then there's less pressure on because politicians are getting pressure from every direction from the public from um, vested interest in industry uh, and so you know they, they are not only maintaining their pressure on policymakers, but also trying to reduce public pressure towards politicians they've you know they've they're playing a really sophisticated well-funded game and, and i'll give you an example in the US. Uh, I was based at George Mason University there for four years. And George Mason University, coincidentally, is also ground zero for fossil fuel influence on universities. So the Koch brothers are um, basically a private fossil fuel company. And they've been investing millions into George Mason University and other universities, trying to get their ideas into academia and then influencing society um, through through that way. And this is a decades long strategy. It's three dimensional chess and it's been somewhat effective. Uh, and so, you know, they're playing very sophisticated games. Okay, thank you. So Claude, you're on next and uh, on deck after you is Keith uh, Kennedy. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I was, uh, I am an, an American member of KCOR, so I live in Minnesota. Um, but I had a conversation with someone uh, who's a gaming partner in Tennessee. And I, I was wondering if you ran across the same thing that seems to be happening here, especially in the uh, the red states, uh, where the religious people are explaining to their flock, yes, climate is real. Now that's a change in as far as I'm concerned that, that this is happening. But uh, the exp explanation is that it's God's will. So. I think that's partly so that their congregation doesn't get torn up, because uh, remember, ministers are politicians. But I was wondering if you ran across that in other countries, uh, or is this kind of a, a unique um, cultural, continuing cultural war that we have going on here in Minnesota, in, excuse me, in the United States? Yeah, that's a, I haven't really re encountered that one much. Um, God's will. It's hard to argue against that one too, because oh. once you invoke God, there's there's just nothing to be said. So it, it actually it's a conversation stops. ender. Yeah, it's and I think that's the purpose of it. In a related thing, because after I had this conversation, within a day, networks uh, Netflix sent me an email about a new program that they have coming up about Moses, and of course it's a trailer, so they have both clips from the series. And then also some uh, people describing it and, and making comments. And uh, one commenter said, well, Moses was really a founding father. And, and my, <laughs> my ears said, 
oh, so so religion and the founding fathers of America, which we want to go back to, you know, it, it's a it's a God thing to be that kind of a patriot. And, and maybe my ears are just too sensitive to that type of thing, but it seemed to me very inappropriate uh, for what is essentially a religious uh, story uh, to, you know, to mix it up that like that. So I could tell that that trailer was at least for the American audience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If, I, if I could, I'll make one more comment about Russia. Two years ago, when Ukraine was invaded, I had uh, my last uh, messenger conversation with a friend that I've known for 20 years, who lives in, in Moscow, probably still does, very well connected. His uh, father was a journalist. So during the Brezhnev years, he was actually educated in London in high school. So I considered him a, success, a very um, sophisticated person as far as what they followed. He knew nothing about climate change. And I even mentioned a couple of women, women scientists who were very instrumental in uh, the methane issue and bringing it about quite early. And he said, I don't know these names. And, and he had other things on his mind, by the way. He signed off from Facebook and you know, went to uh, uh, telegraph, uh, telegram, excuse me. Um, but uh, but that tells me that it's a taboo subject and, and they use maybe self-censorship more than we do, but uh, it also tells me that they're not very well prepared um, for what's coming either. Right, so thank you. So um, Keith Kennedy, you're on next and uh, Paul Beckwith on deck. Thank you very much, uh, David, appreciate it. And John, thank you for your early morning hours. You're probably used to it since you deal all over the world, but we appreciate it, so thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm a fairly active climate person in uh, across Canada, and I'm just wondering how, or is there some way to take this particular app, app and apply it beyond the younger group, if you will? How, how do we take this app and make it more universal? Or is that just me not figuring out that, yes, you can use it anywhere? How young is younger group to you? Well, seniors. <laughs> At over um, 60. Most right, of okay, so what I've seen from pictures of the folks are here, they're most of us yeah. in the audience. And right. yet, despite that in Canada, we probably, of the 9 million over 60, one in four Canadians are over 60. So how do we, how do we take this and make it real and, and use it as an educational tool also for a different part of the population, if you will? Yeah, so the, I didn't mention this in the res, when I was talking about the research results from the Cranky Uncle game, but there's this really counterintuitive result we found in our data um, for people playing Cranky Uncle, which I still have been unable to explain. Basically, the older people are in the game, the bigger the effect has on improving their critical thinking. In other words, we found that with teens, it has a small effect, but not, not very large. And then as they get older and older, you just see a bigger improvement in their critical thinking to the point where you get to seniors, it's like, I forget, it's like a 10% increase or something. It's just way bigger than, than any other age range, which is the opposite of what we thought it would be. We would thought that we would see a bigger increase with younger people and it would decrease as you got older. And it's the opposite. So, so firstly, a game like the Cranky Uncle, which you would think is it's all cartoons, it's kind of, you think it would be geared for young people, but it has its biggest effect amongst seniors. Um, that's so that's great news to me. <laughs> I think oh, it should it be is. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. It's um, and, and I still don't understand. I've yeah, I have I actually have no idea why. Um, open to um, you know, suggested hypotheses on why. But the real the real question then is how do you get it to seniors? How do you distribute the game? Because we've been really using classrooms as our way of distributing and disseminating the game uh, and my guess is through networks like um, you know organizations where you would have seniors getting together 
but it, we haven't done that in an organized way yet. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. So if I can just follow up, uh, excuse me, David, I mean, just follow up in that same vein. There are probably on the order of close to 500 environmental NGOs in Canada, most of whom are composed of 60 to 80% seniors. And that looks like a reasonable target. The other thing I wondered about was there's a, a technique that had been, I'm sure you're familiar with it, that was developed in California called deep canvassing, which has a longer term horizon than the use of a game that you're talking about. But its overall purpose is to engage with the entire community to address conflicting situations and differences of opinion. Is there, have you thought about how to bring this as a tool into that sort of longer term engagement within communities of 50 to 100,000 where, where there is a really divisive issue and yet we know from our, we, we would hope that there is one way forward as opposed to in Canada, the conservatives who are very much anti progressive in terms of clean energy, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with deep canvassing, but I haven't thought about how you might incorporate the game within that framework. But um, an important um, way that we think about the Cranky Uncle game is that it's not meant to be a standalone thing, but that it can be most effective within a larger program. That's certainly how UNICEF are thinking about it, um, that it's not just getting people to play cranky uncle vaccine, but get them into larger programs where cranky vaccine is kind of a hook or a just a, a one interactive and engaging part of a broader program. So I'm not really answering your question, but um, um, cert yeah, th I think that doing something like what you describe would be how the game could be used, just making it a hook or an, an engaging part of, of a broader program. But... I'm not familiar enough with the deep can canvassing methodology to kind of make an informed comment on it, I'm afraid. But thank you very much, appreciate yeah. it. Paul, you're on next, and we actually don't have a questioner right now after you to put on deck. So those of you who are listening, do give some thought to whether you'd like to, join, to ask John any, any other questions. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, John, uh, very interesting hey, talk. Paul. We've actually Good met uh, in yeah. person, and I believe, was it at Madrid, at the Madrid COP, or which, with Glasgow, which COP did you go to? Um, Paris, I think. Paris, maybe 2015, that long ago. I remember it was mm -hmm. outside the front steps in front of all the flags and so on, and we chatted. Yeah. Yeah, so we, with, all, we with were, all those big pillars. For each yeah, you country. were shortly out, out of school. Anyway, it's great uh, <laughs> that you're having so much success with your game. I, I just, I interviewed uh, Bill McGibbon just a couple of weeks ago, and he's really pushing uh, what he calls third act. He's, um, so he's trying, he, for two years, he's had this organization. He he, he was, he basically founded 350.org and then moved mm -hmm. to uh, third act for the last two years, which is, you know, he's, his, his statistic is 70 million Americans over the age of 60. Uh, they're joined by about 10, 15,000 people every single day. They have money, they have power. There's no known way to stop them voting. So they, they have a lot of sway and uh, he's, um, you know, that's his hope that they can um, get political change in the US. But I did have a couple of questions about Canadian politics. So we have a uh, carbon price or carbon tax. I th think it should have been called the pollution tax would have been much better than a carbon tax. But, and a lot of the money that is raised goes back uh, to the public, so people get checks and so on. And the rate is going up uh, soon, um, I believe April 1st. And the opposite, so this is our liberal government in power, Trudeau. Uh, the opposition, Pierre Polyev, um, has the slogan, Axe Attacks. And he goes around the country with rallies, Axe Attacks, Axe Attacks, Axe Attacks. And the liberals don't really respond, they just kind of ignore it. And I think that's a mistake. So given what you know, um, would you what would you recommend as being effective ways for the Trudeau government to say, hey, we need this tax? I mean, apart from educating the public saying, well, you know, climate is going to hell, ocean temperatures are huge, 
record temperatures. Like they don't do any of that educating the public, the liberal government. I think they fall short on that. So do you have any suggest? What would you suggest to to Trudeau and the liberals to to nix this idea of, you know, axe attacks? It's kind of Trumpian, I believe. And by the way, Trump's latest business venture is, is selling sixty dollar leather bound Bibles. I thought that was fake, but apparently, you know, it's it's maybe it is fake. Maybe I fell for no, it. No, no, it's it's real. Something. Um, so, not only is it real, but a previous question it was talking about, like, uh, was it Moses for being the founding father? The 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 feature of this Bible that really jumps out at me is that they also include within the Bible the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and and all the um. Yeah, you know, these founding father documents uh, from okay, that's US what you're history. talking about earlier. I missed the, the the question. Okay, okay, so the Bible thing is true. Okay, so what yeah. should liberals be doing? I mean, you know, axe attacks is a populist mm -hmm. sort of chant, which is uh, and and Polyev is way ahead in the polls right now. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, we don't have an what? election for a year and a half, so. So I don't mean to scare all the Canadian people in this um, in this mm. Zoom meeting, but we had an election a decade-ish ago where our progressive government had a price on carbon and the Conservatives led with axe the tax as their main slogan, and mm -hmm. they won resoundingly. And right. the axe the tax slogan, I think, was catchy enough um, that it, it it cut through and contributed to the Conservatives winning. And first thing he did was he axed the tax. He removed the price on carbon and Australian climate policy went backwards. So mm -hmm. that works. It's an effective yes. strategy. You, you ignore it at your own peril. I would recommend to the, to the Trudeau government that they look at history and what happened in Australia. Um, and I, I'm like, I'm not a political expert or anything so just yeah. talking from a psych psychology and communication point of view the the general principle and i can't give you a specific answer but the general principle is fight sticky myths with stickier facts ax the tax is a sticky slogan you need mm. to uh, counter it with something that's even stickier I don't know what that is but i remember so so uh, ideally it would be like a three or four word slogan which completely yeah, I, obliterates the idea of axe attacks. Yeah, um, and we so that's what the <laughs> yeah. Oh, but back. So did you, yeah, you so it wasn't countered in Australia really. There wasn't an effective counter because um, you know, or at least it didn't. You know, the election was a landslide, as you say. Uh, yeah, I don't know uh, if it was a landslide, but there was, was a, certainly a big swing towards the Conservatives, and they won government. Um, yeah, um, well, pretty, I, I, pretty clear. Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, you know, my last comment on Canadian politics, I guess, is that I'm pretty convinced that if, if that Trump guy gets in in the U.S., that that will destroy the conservatives in Canada and people won't dare vote for a party, you know, and, and the liberals should just be promoting the, the conservatives as many Trumps and things like that. Um, you know, I mean, you have to fight fire with fire, basically. So, you know, if they just push that, Polyev and the conservatives and you know their policies would just be Trumpian policies that should be enough to not to, to counter counter their you know axe attacks and other things I'm guessing but anyway that's a little bit of Canadian politics uh, it's always hard when you you know when you've been leader for you know eight years or so you know to, to win a third time um, personally I think he should step down and let somebody new come in and then there wouldn't be a, an issue I think they'd the liberals would win again easily, but that's not happening. Trudeau doesn't see that. So that's okay. a bit of Canadian politics. Thank you. Anyway, great talk. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, I understand that Jane Shaw has a question. And also, I believe that Keith Kennedy would be on next. You're on deck, Keith. Jane Shaw? Have we lost Jane Shaw? I don't see any Jane Shaw. Oh, okay. So you know uh, what she left. Okay, that's too bad. Okay, I think Keith Kennedy has another question. Okay, uh, never mind the video. Uh, Dr. Cook, thank you again. Uh, 
Anything happening in the uh, OPEC countries with respect to this uh, rollout of your of your app? Um, no, not yet. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, and really, yeah, um, translation wise and classroom wise, um, yeah, unfortunately not. It's, it's, be, it's been very Europe, <laughs> North America centric for the cranky classic and very Africa with just one foray into Southeast Asia for cranky uncle vaccine. So, um, there's a lot of world yet for us to cover. <laughs> Okay, I, I ask because Saudi Arabia and Canada have, uh, in the re most recent poll or most recent statistics released Friday, are equal in their greenhouse gas emissions, and that also must be something of a worrisome note to those who are trying to move towards clean energy because we are so high in our production and and emissions, um, and and I wonder if that isn't also a bit of a cloud over the ability to, to move people to a different behavioral pattern uh, when we're when we're ostensibly so dependent according to all the fossil fuel companies and and Ontario and Alberta and Saskatchewan on the fossil fuel industry okay so I think we're getting near the end of our time um if there's one, if there is any single question remaining, we can take it. But otherwise, I'm going to hand over to Ted Manning to thank uh, our speaker and wrap up the session. I, I'm I can't I have a question, but I can't start my video. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I think Anita Thorhag has another question. She lists. Uh, maybe let her go first, and then I'll wrap up for you. Okay, sorry if I missed you any time. Uh, yeah. I can't, uh, I guess I can unmute, but I can't start the video. All right. So I'm just following the money trail once more and wondering if you have made any kind of estimate of the gas and oil companies directly paying off decision makers in the various countries. We know that some countries like Canada are hard to pay off and others like the United States with their bundling of money and their many shell corporations are easier and many of the African and Latin American are fairly easy to pay off. But do you have a, a global kind of how much are they directly paying to the decision makers versus how much do they put into these campaigns where they're influencing media of all kinds and outreach of all kinds? Yeah, I'm not, well, certainly I haven't done any work on that front and I'm not familiar with anyone who's given that kind of broader overview like what you're asking in terms of how much in, in this relative to that. Um, it's really my my impression is that it's more piecemeal, and there's been different NGOs that have looked at um, specific countries or specific sectors. But yeah, I I'm not familiar with a kind of global outlook of that type. It would be a, a huge, incredible work uh, that probably requires resources. But it's it's different climate NGOs that have mainly done this kind of work. You know, because the seems to me that one of the really easy ways to discredit them in the name of any country that's thinking is to let them know how much money they've been paying to the decision makers. And I'm sure that would work in Northern Europe and in North America, but it probably would work in many other places. I mean, if you want to discredit the misinformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh... Ted, will you go ahead? Well, David, I think you should respond to that because you're an expert in that field. That that you're the person I'd go to to ask to answer that last question, and then I can wrap it up. <laughs> you there, David? Well, am I? I think you're referring to my background in whistleblowing as a way of that's correct. Yeah. Yes, I mean one the one I can't answer your question, Anitra, but what I can tell you is that Canada is not nearly as clean 
and well-governed and free of corruption, as most people in other countries believe, and as most Canadians believe. You know, structurally, we have very serious problems, which just mean that corruption goes on, but it's very well hidden. So uh, that's my comment. Over to you, Ted. Okay, well, thank you very much. As I say, there's a great deal we can talk about. And you have in front of you a bunch of frustrated civil servants and scientists and others who have tried to use information and other tricks to counter the people who wish to, uh, to fool us. So thank you very much for the lessons, John. There's a lot of things either I didn't know and I'm certainly going to go through it again. I think a lot of the other people are. So once again, thank you ever so much. And uh, I'll sort of wrap it up now on behalf of KCOR. Say that thank you everyone for coming. If you do not belong to KCOR, we would encourage you to pay your dues because that's what pays to keep this on the air. And also our YouTube sessions that now get up to the thousands of people uh, for many of the presentations. Uh, we are at least doing some outreach and we're kind of hoping one day to evaluate how effective it really was. Anyway, that said, thank you all very much for coming. Please, if you do go on to the uh, YouTube, please subscribe to it. And other than that, we will wrap up this presentation and we can have it open for a little while longer if people are still awake. It's late in Canada. It's probably not, it's probably early for you, John, in, in Australia. <laughs> But uh, let's, uh, Art, if you can turn off the recording.